an example. This example is an application of an application of Rolle's theorem. So hint, Rolle's theorem is going to come into play somehow. All right, here is your task. Use calculus to prove that the equation x cubed plus x minus 1 equals 0 has exactly one root. Prove that there's exactly one real number. Clarifying question. Um, that there's exactly one, one second, that there's exactly one real number which satisfies this equation. Okay, think about that for a minute. Of course, because yeah. as we yes. see right here, it just, as we see right here, it says, yeah, whenever a math theorem says there exists a point C, we always mean, whenever we say there is one, we mean at least one. Oh yeah, exists is like, you have E with an exclamation point. Is that what that means? <laughs> um, is E with an exclamation point uh, exactly one? I or? have a whiteboard marker, true or false? If we're being mathematicians. False. false. What? No, true. true. I have a whiteboard <laughs> marker. I do have a marker. I have two, but I have one. Yeah. Exactly. Whenever we say there exists one, we mean at least one. Unless I go out of my way to say exactly one and underline it, which is what I'm doing here. So actually, I, I think what makes this problem tricky is that you guys are inexperienced with doing formal math proofs. It's very, very, very often in math that you have to prove that there's exactly one of some objects. And it really goes in two stages. And anyone like, know what's up? Dan Chen, seem like a math boy. Wait. Yeah, Gabe. I really know, but maybe we could like factor it and then Wait, apply. Wait, hold on. Before, before we talk about like algebra and stuff, can you just decompose um, the statement that there's exactly one root into like two simpler statements, which seem like it could be separately proved and then combined into the fact that there's exactly one? Right. Anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? Jordy. Well, first proof that it has roots. Mm -hmm. Then prove it, um, prove it has at least one root. Well, I guess that's kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And then we can prove that it has exactly one root. And that maybe, I don't know. Okay, so Jordy says that it might be possible to first show that there is a root at all, and then, having shown that there is a root, how do I show that there's exactly one, Elnor? Um, well, if you sh like prove that there are roots by. Okay. Oh. So. You could, well, you first would like find the roots, and it's like, I know there's roots here. Okay. And then you would make intervals so that you show, or find the one root. You okay, let's just start. That let's just start. There prove that, first, there. prove this, sorry, man. Prove there's a root. First, prove there's a root. Go. This should be pretty easy to do. Not super easy, well, but kind when of. When I say root, you mean real root, right? Yeah, real root. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Yep. All root. In this class, only real numbers ever. We're going to go kind of fast. Anyone got it already? Yo. Yeah, you could, you could kind of like bust out some like weird pre calc C facts that we never really proved properly, but just kind of did. But I don't want to do it that way. With calculus, we can do this like smooth. Anybody? This is a good day where like the first one to come up with an idea, just like make it happen. James, what do you got? You can use the intermediate value theorem. Can you be more specific? So you can like plug in zero, and that would be negative one. Yeah. He first one. says he first says let's introduce a function. Uh, let that function be x cubed plus x minus one, uh, and then let's note that this function is like you know a polynomial, so it's continuous everywhere. And then this is actually goes back to what we were doing five six weeks ago, right? It's also differentiable everywhere. It is differentiable, but for this part at least, derivatives are irrelevant because James, this time everyone's going to pay attention. Plug in zero. Plug in zero. You do get negative one. You plug in one. You plug in one. And then you get one. And you get one. 
Brilliant, right? Is this all coming back? I know we did this a while ago. You plug in zero, you get negative one. You plug in one, you get one. And thus, by the intermediate value theorem, there must be a root. So this is just a little extra practice with writing this all out, right? We say, F is a polynomial. Uh, so continuous everywhere. In particular, F is continuous on the interval 0, 1. Uh, and then, remember how to write this? Daniel Jacobson, do you remember this kind of stuff? Why does it have a root? Do you remember? Uh, just because it crosses by the intermediate value here, it must pass 0 on its way from negative 1 to 1. Yeah, so you suggest the y value 0 as lying between those two y values, right? You say, you say 0 is some number which lies between, um, negative, one. between negative 1 and 1. And 1 is, is f of 1, negative 1 is f of 0. And then so by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a point c um, on the interval 0, 1, such that f of c is 0. Okay, so that was that had nothing to do with really what we were doing uh, yesterday and today. That just shows that there is a root. Everybody agree? All right, now that I have showed that there is a root, how do I show that there is exactly one? Okay. Um, it's kind of like pick up C, but like you could, like, oh. Wait, oh, again, yeah, this isn't mind. even a math question. That. This is just a basic logic question. Oh. Yeah. And sure that the function doesn't turn around to go back towards... Yeah, you're doing more math. Okay, you guys just don't know how to um, do, like, math. So maybe I have, I have to O period 3 to apologize. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, period 9 would now was a second. Um, Eleanor. You could just expand the interval. No, 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 no. This is actually more general than... This is more general than calculus or anything. This is just... In general, how do you show that there exists a unique object? You first show that there is one, and then you just show that there's only one. How do you show that there's only one? Show that there are not others. In other words, yeah, yeah. Okay, I guess I guess this is just the moment where I'm going to learn how to do this. Um, just suppose there are two. And then that'll just lead to a contradiction. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's so cute. You guys, are so, you guys are so young and inexperienced. Yeah. If when you do math, when you do like higher level math, you just do this exact, exact same move just over and over and over again, like hundreds of times. Something. It's, it's, like a, it's a very common math thing to prove that there exists a unique object satisfying certain qualities. And in all those cases, it's always a two step process. First, show that there is one, then you show that there's only one. And to show that there's only one, that's equivalent to saying that there are not two. Right? Wait, but it, two. Couldn't that still lead to contradiction? Wait, I'm not gonna, okay. It, it still Do you guys agree that showing you that if you okay, at, at least three. one and at most one, at least one and not two implies exactly one? What That's really all I was trying to get you to say. Oh well, whatever. It's okay if I just tell you stuff sometimes. Um, Julian, show, assume that there are two roots and explain why that leads to a contradiction. numbers which are both roots. Whoever says it first, I don't care, talk at the same time. Rational root theorem. Rational root theorem. Eleanor. Use Rolle's theorem. theorem, yes. If I have two numbers, A and B, which both give me zero, then it seems like Rolle's theorem is applicable, right? Yeah. Because this function f is certainly continuous and differentiable, blah, 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 blah. So by Rolle's theorem, what? Um, so you're assuming that there's some point in there where the derivative is there exists a point C such that f prime of C is zero. Okay. And then you can find f prime of C or f prime of x. What is f prime of x? Uh, 3x squared plus c1. And then you want to find that zero except for no. Except for no. You see what's going on here? 
we take the derivative, and this derivative is in fact always positive. Right? This derivative is always positive. So this, um, what Rolle's theorem says is what goes up must come down. If the function is 0 here and it's 0 again later, then we now know by Rolle's theorem that there must be somewhere where the derivative is 0. But this function's derivative is never 0. This function's derivative is always positive. This is a contradiction. And so our supposition that there were two distinct numbers which were both roots has led to a contradiction. Follow? Okay, cool. That went 1% better than it went third period. Um, all right. Um, uh, gave no time. Now, in the last 25 minutes of class, we will talk about like the real actual goal of today, um, which is a really very important theorem. Can you guys close those blinds? Um, so, the actual important thing uh, for today is this theorem. It is so important. It is called the mean value theorem. And it is, I would say, the second most important theorem in all of calculus. And the mean value theorem is very related to Rolle's theorem. It's a very close cousin. And in fact, the mean value theorem is just Rolle's theorem, but you take out a condition, the third one. Uh, so, all right, let's just explore this. Suppose f is continuous on the closed interval AB, and f is differentiable on the open interval AB. What can I then say about this function? Well, maybe I'll just draw one. Or maybe I'll draw four, just like before. Here's A, here's B. Now I no longer, um, I no longer uh, feel that or it's no longer the true that f of a has to equal f of b. So let's just put them, you know, not equal. What are all the possible kinds of functions that might so result? It's just, wait, so what's the then? I don't know. I haven't told you yet. You're supposed to figure that out. Just talk. Just express your feelings. Shout some crap out. Well, if, if there's something bigger than both of them, then we still have like a similar thing where there's going to be a place where... Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, what, let's just talk. What's one thing that might happen? It could just be a line. It could just be a line, right? It could just go... So does the derivative have to be zero in this case? No, right here, the derivative is not zero. What's another thing that might happen? It could go like... could go like up? Yeah. In fact, I'm going to draw it in such a way that I'm going to try to draw it. So that's not a line. Well, that's kind of crappy. Trying to do well, whatever. Um, we'll just do something like that. Wait, there's one, another case. There's a ball. Yeah. What else? What if a is greater than b? Yeah. Well, okay. who cares, right? Yeah. I could, could, could also like maybe it. could also maybe do like that, or I could kind of do a little. Whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. So it's like Rolle's theorem turned sideways, or something. That's how some people like to think of it. What must be true? What can I say about this? Function. Now, Sam again. Um, it's like there's a point where. Special point where oh, what? Oh, there's a, some point on the function where the derivative is equal to the slope of the line between A and B. Yeah. Good, Ankit, if that's what you said. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? Here, if you think about what's going on, if this function is quote unquote constant, it's not constant, but it's constantly increasing, then everywhere on this line, the rate at which the function is increasing is, is, is constant, okay? Here, the rate is different, but if I think about um, what slow steady progress would look like, slow steady progress from f of a to f of b would look like a straight line, right? Somewhere on this interval, says the mean value theorem, there is a special point at which the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. Make sense? The pictures are quite beautiful. Uh, again, here, if I draw the secant line, there exists some point at which 
the slope of the secant line is equal to the slope of the tangent line. And of course, we're learning so much math today, oh, terrible line. Uh, that when, whenever we say there exists one, we really mean at least one. So there might be, there might be more. All right, so the conclusion of this theorem is there exists a point C on the interval AB such that the derivative at C is equal to the slope of the line through A comma F of A and B comma F of B. How are we feeling about this? All right, and um, I, I have high expectations for deep understanding of this theorem. Um, you can really think about this theorem in like three different ways. On the one hand, it's just a simple statement. Hey man, somewhere on here, the derivative has to equal this number. But a geometric interpretation of the mean value theorem is what I've presented here. Somewhere on the interval, the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. Okay, but we also didn't just come up with the word derivative. We didn't just come up with the definition of derivative out of nowhere. Derivative is supposed to mean something. It's supposed to represent like change, right? So what is the slope of the secant? What is the meaning of the slope of the secant line? The average derivative. Yeah, the average. I don't even think I need to use the word derivative at all to talk about the slope of the secant line. Average. The average speed or average rate of change, right? Yeah, the slope of the, the, the if, I, if I have some function here, which is that, and that's a comma f of a, and that's b comma f of b, then f of b minus f of a is the total change, and b minus a is the amount of time it took for that to happen. So the meaning of the slope of the secant line is the average rate of change of the function. If it's a position function, then it's the average speed. But in more general, it's the average rate at which the function is changing over that time interval. And the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. So on a deep level, what the mean value theorem says is that somewhere on any interval, the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change on that interval. Yes? I kind of feel like we could prove this with the other one. Yeah, we like, definitely can. Yeah. Okay, could someone, um, responsible and normal, turn the camera over here for a minute? There is a oh. very important story. <laughs> you probably need to like, stand up and look, look okay. through it, or not. Um, so there is, a, there, is, uh, there is a story that is associated with the mean value theorem. Um, even though we're out of time, we're going to waste four minutes talking about this. So um, there is this place called New Jersey. Um, I, though I practiced drawing your jersey for four minutes today during lunch, this is still going to be the worst picture. I also grew up in New Jersey, so I really can't do it. It might be like kind of actually sort of okay. All right, this is New Jersey. Um, this is like Pennsylvania over here. This is like New York. Um, right here is um, this is uh, New York City. And down here is like, is like Philly, more or less. And there is this road called the New Jersey Turnpike. And the New Jersey Turnpike starts over here, like at um, Delaware, and it ends over here in New York City, and it runs kind of like through the whole state like this. Okay. So um, it's a big highway, and it's meant for people to like get the hell through New Jersey as fast as possible um, to New York City. Um, and um, and uh, in order to do that, uh, it, it cuts across the entire state. All right, so now rewind to a time before um, Easy Pass. Okay, you guys have just grown up in the, your whole lives with the Easy Pass system. But and it used to be you have to like actually stop and pay tolls with like coins. They're made of metal, um, <laughs> and um, and it was really annoying because every time you have to stop, you know the entire highway has to like slow down. It's terrible. So. Um, and uh, there is, is a kind of an engineering task of, well, how do we design toll booths uh, in such a way that's fair? Because if we, if we have them very, very often, then it's just ridiculous because we're constantly stopping and it's really like, tedious. But if we, don't have, if we have them only like every 100 miles, then just no one will go to that point. They'll just drive around them, right? So you want to, on the one hand, you want to have the toll booths very, very often to make it fair so that you pay proportional to the amount of time you spend on the highway. Are you with me? Yeah. But on the other hand, you don't want to stop too often. So the New Jersey Turnpike is a special road in that you're not meant to really be getting on and off of it very often. Uh, and so there are like a sort of very small number of stops. 
There's one, there's like exit one, then there's like exit two, there's exit three, and et cetera, et cetera. There are only like about 18 stops throughout the entire thing. So sometimes there's gaps of like 10, 12 miles in between stops, especially in southern Jersey. Okay, so what they've done is they, they set up this system back in forever, a long time ago, again, before Easy Pass, in which when you would get on, you would get a ticket. And the ticket would be linked to whatever stop that you entered at. So if you entered at stop three, let's say, and then you were going to get off again at stop like eight, um, then on your every ticket that you every ticket that you got, uh, it would have a little timestamp on it, and it would say, okay, you you got to exit three at a certain time. And if you flip to the back, there was this pretty little chart, and the chart is especially funny for like a five-year-old kid with nothing to do. You look at the chart, and it tells you depending on what exit you are going to leave at, uh, how much you have to pay based on how many axles your car has and stuff like that, right? And if you're going to go all the way, then you have the ticket starts at one, and if you lose your ticket, you have to pay as if you came all the way from here. Okay. So, uh, and then what happens is there's a toll booth. As you, at every exit, there's a toll booth where you pay, and then you pay based proportionally on how long you've been on the road. Does everyone understand the story? Okay. So it's pretty easy. Um, the, now comes Easy Pass, and when we get Easy Pass, now uh, suddenly this is all automated for us, right? The Easy Pass thing will 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 keep track of exactly which exit I entered at and which exit I exited from, and it will just do the math automatically. You can just drive and just pay hundreds of dollars and not think about it. Um, okay. Well, something interesting happened. As a side note, uh, or as a, as, a, as a side result of the prevalence of Easy Pass, suddenly the following situation could happen. Let's say that this entire distance is um, 100 miles. Um, which I think is approximately correct, or approximately maybe not correct at all. Uh, so let's just say when you get on, suppose you're driving to New York City, and you um, enter at 8 a.m., and the Easy Pass um, computer notes that you entered at 8 a.m., and then you leave New York City at 9 a.m. Now, in addition to charging you, uh, in addition to charging you the sixteen dollars or whatever it is for your full use of the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, another fact about your morning was made apparent by this computer. What? Too much coffee. Too much coffee. Yeah, um, I was going pretty fast, right? In fact, how fast was I going? Hundred miles per hour. Key point here. Average. On average. On average, I was going 100 miles per hour. But there's no law against going a certain um, speed on average. The law says that at no point may you go 100 miles per hour. Okay, but, uh, so what they proposed, this was, like a hot, this was like a hot topic like in the 90s when I was just getting my driver's license and still lived in New Jersey, before I thankfully got the hell out of there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was a, they, they proposed actually doing this. What would happen is, you would get on, you would get off, and then a siren would go off, and um, a, a cop car would pull you over, and um, a policeman and a mathematician would get out, <laughs> and would tell you, well, sir, you have averaged 100 miles per hour over the last hour, and as your position function of your car is a continuous and differentiable function, by the mean value theorem, there must have existed a point at which you were going exactly 100 miles per hour, uh, and thus here's your ticket for this theoretical point that there goes. Yes, Gabe? Just think of all the time in court spent by people who don't know math. Are yeah, answers. I know. Okay, good. Um, so, um, turn the camera back. That was a little bit of a diversion, but that is really what the mean value theorem says. The mean value theorem says that there exists a special point on every interval, which in some sense represents the interval. Um, this point represents the interval in the sense that the rate at which I was going at that point is the rate uh, I could have been going the entire time to achieve the same change. Are you with me? That's actually pretty deep. Alright. No time for understanding. Let's do the proof. Um, okay, so the proof is awesome. And um, Gabe says, isn't the mean value theorem just kind of like Rolle's theorem? It really, oh, really is. Um, um, and can be proven using Rolle's theorem. But I, what about the Watch, intermediate no. value theorem? We now start. Uh, we now start the proof. So, all right, here we go. Here's A, and here's B. And I'm going to draw a generic function which, um, and my function f, I need to, it's kind of hard to do this properly. Okay, 
here is my function f. And I tried to draw it in such a way that the derivative is never zero. It doesn't really matter, but it kind of matters for my story. So here's my function f. All right, uh, and of course, this point is a comma f of a, and this point is b comma f of b. Okay. Mm, what I'd like to do uh, is to prove, what I need to prove is that there exists a point C on the interval A, B, such that F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. In other words, find that point on this interval, show that there must exist a point on that interval in which the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change. All right, well, let's draw in this average uh, from rate of change line. Ooh, terrible line. Whatever. Okay, can somebody give me the equation of this line? Just in general? That? Yeah, equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, that's just the line which is, goes through a comma f of a and has slope f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Everyone cool with that? Okay, so in order to be able to discuss this function, let's name it. Let's name this function g. So g is the line function. Uh, and, well, it's basically the same thing, right? Its slope is f of b minus f of a over b minus a times x minus a, and then I'll just add on that f of a. Right. So g of x is a function which, given an input of x, will tell you where you are on that line. Everybody with me? Okay, no time. Um, so what I need to prove, can somebody now restate thus what it is that I really kind of need to prove? Now that I have this function f and this function g floating around, another way of thinking about it is, okay? At some x, um, f prime of x equals g prime of x? Yeah, yeah. Another way, of another way of stating, good, thank you. Another way of stating what we need to prove is that there exists a c such that f prime of c equals g prime of c. Right? Because what is the derivative of g, after all? The derivative of g is just a constant. The derivative of g is just the slope of that line. So if I want to say that somewhere the derivative of f equals the slope of g, that's another way of saying somewhere I want those two functions to have the same derivative. I wonder how I will, I will prove that these two functions have the same derivative somewhere. Let's see who's been paying attention to the heavily foreshadowed event that I mentioned multiple times. How can I show that these two functions have derivatives which are equal somewhere? Use Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem is going to come into play somehow. Do immediate value theorem. Do you make like a function which is the f prime of uh, c minus the g prime of c? Kind of, yeah. You got the right gist, right? If we want to show that two functions are equal somewhere, or in this case we want to show that the derivatives are equal, Oh, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a new function, which is the difference of those two functions. Yes, James, that is correct. Um, so watch. We will now make a new function h, and let h be uh, f of x minus g of x. OK. Um, so uh, talk to me about this function h. It has some pretty awesome properties. What's h of? A. Zero. Zero, yeah, right? What is, if we, if we look at this, H of A is just F of A minus G of A, but F of A and G of A are the same, right? And what is H of B? Zero. Yeah, it's F of B minus G of B. Also, also zero. Ha ha, now everyone, what, what are we going to do? Take the derivative. Okay, yeah, I guess. But immediately following on this on this fact, so what about this function h? Regina. Take the derivative of 
you can the derivatives of like f of derivative of c minus g of derivative of c equals zero. Like, oh, oh. Or something. Yeah, but oh, you're not saying the key it. word. Yeah, yeah anyone, there. everyone. Use rules there. Yeah, exactly. Look, I now have this function h, which at two separate points is the same. And okay, I'm too lazy to write this all out, but f by assumption is continuous and differentiable. G is just a line, it's continuous and differentiable. So f, the f minus g function must also be continuous and differentiable. And so what I'm going to do right now is simply apply Rolle's theorem, apply Rolle's theorem uh, to h on the interval a, b. And what does Rolle's theorem say? There exists such that uh, h prime of c is zero, right? That's what I know about this h function. That since it starts and ends at the same place, there's a place where the derivative of zero. But of course, and as someone else said, what is h prime of x? H prime of x is just f prime of x minus g prime of x, and so h prime of c is just f prime of c minus g prime of c, and if that's zero then f prime of c equals g prime of c. Cool? You guys cool? Okay. Um, what does this all mean? This proof can get kind of technical, but in fact, I think, that in fact, first of all, I think, I think it's actually not that hard. But I also, I, I have really high standards for understanding here. And I'd like to maybe tell one more story, because I think it makes sense. Oh, great, okay. perfect amount of time. Um, this is a story of, um, it's a personal story. Um, I tried to run a marathon um, a long time ago, like 10 years ago, um, but um, I just copied off my girlfriend, like she was running a marathon, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that too. Um, but she was training properly and like for months, like you're supposed to do, and I just decided at the last minute I was going to do it like a month before, it, or maybe like six weeks. So I started running, I was really young and in shape back then, now I'm like old and fat. Um, but uh, so I started running, but I didn't, you can't just do that. You have to like build slowly, otherwise you'll just like, hurt your knees and stuff. So that's what happened. And I, um, I got really hurt, and then I couldn't do the marathon. Um, but I did do the half marathon. And, um, uh, and I, as I hurt my knee, so then like three or four weeks before the marathon, I didn't do any running at all. And, uh, and it, so I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll just do the half instead. So I was like in really good shape, naming this is the point. I was in really good shape, but my knee was still not recovered. So I started the race. So this F function, this is me. I started the race really strong, being all cocky and thinking that I could just like run it in like a really short amount of time, and I went really fast. Um, and then I passed all these people because the way it worked, um, you just get in line in like a giant. There's like a giant. That's how racing. And then you put a little chip in your shoe so they know when you cross the line, so there's no disadvantage of being in the back. So I was like all the way in the back. And the race started. And I was like running so fast. So I started passing people like everyone. I'm just passing like everyone. And as they're passing people, they're like, yeah, there's nothing else to do. So I'm like, yeah, passing you, passing you, passing you. So I'm passing everyone. You remember them. As you pass them, you're like remembering who they are, right? And then somewhere, my knee started hurting. And then it started hurting more, and then it started hurting a lot. And I was practically just like limping and crawling. The last three or four miles were terrible. And I had to suffer the indignity of watching every single person, basically who I passed, then, then pass me again on the back end of the race. All right, so 